Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome um, to St. John's. Welcome if you're, if you're new and not been before. It's great to, to have you with us um, tonight for our evening service. I'm Eddie, the vicar here at St. John's. Later, we're going to be um, hearing from ha- Hannah Lockwood, who's just sitting down here at the front, who's going to be speaking um, on our series, our one series. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an exciting moment because we are beginning our uh, youth group in the evening again called Fuel, and uh, they'll be going out shortly. So it's, it's great that they can meet again um, tonight. Um, but uh, in way of beginning, let's just, we, we, last week we had a, an open to questions about mental health, and uh, maybe we've forgotten what the one series is all about. Well, we're going to show the little clip that uh, uh, introduces it and shares the, the passage from Ephesians So, Mark, thank you. It's our union with Christ that makes us one. The foundation of our unity isn't membership of a club, adherence to a moral code, or losing our God-given diversity. Instead, it's the result of the Holy Spirit indwelling each believer. So let's come back together in Christ, loving and serving the Lord Jesus as one. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this service. Thank you that you've made us one. You've made us one in Christ, and we meet in his name tonight. Uh, We pray as we meet that you will direct us to Christ, to the one Lord um, that we've been hearing about in this series, that you will unify us around the Lord Jesus. So as we begin this service, please, um, would you be with us? Would you uh, lead us? And would you uh, affect us as we hear your word um, spoken? as we hear it preached, as we come together in fellowship in Christ. We pray that you'll be with us and direct us and lead us, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Liam. He's going to lead us in our opening song. Should we stand together? The Son of Heaven 
heaven rose again O oh, trample death Where is your sting? The angels roll For Christ the King O oh, praise the name Of the Lord our God O oh, praise His name Forever He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus. to you confess to God now. When we confess, we, we're crying out to God for forgiveness. If we're, if we're honest with ourselves, we haven't, we haven't loved God with our whole hearts this week, and we've not loved those around us. So we're going to read these words together. They'll be on the screen. Shall we confess together? Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And hear these words from Psalm 32. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die in our place. Help us to trust him with our sin. Help us to trust your word of forgiveness for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Gracious Father, Son, and Spirit, ever joined in bonds of love, may your church share in the union of our God, the three in one. May the love of God our Father poured on us in Christ the Son. In the union of His Spirit, fill our hearts and make us one. We are one in Christ our Savior. In His death, 
we all have died in his resurrection power we in him are made alive so we all as ransom sinners stand united in his love drawing near to God together by his spirit through his son through his word our gracious savior draws us to himself in love builds us up into a temple where by grace he dwells with us on foundations of his promise built on him our cornerstone may we stand as one forever may his love in us be shown sad divisions in your gospel make us one bound together by your spirit bought by Jesus precious blood living worthy of our calling let us cast all strife aside till as one we see his glory as his perfect holy bride keep us steadfast in your promise standing firm with all the saints till at last we come to heaven and as one we see your face God, our Father, thank you so much that you, you have made us one in Christ. You've brought us together in Christ through his death and resurrection, through the good news of Jesus. May that affect everything that we do, and not just as individuals, but as a church, affect our lives, that it might transform us, that it would build fellowship. It would build us in our, the way that we look at ourselves, but also the way that we look at the world. We thank you for this unity we share. Praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you want to take a seat? Um, today is, uh, well, this morning, we call this morning service Mission Sunday. It's where we have a particular focus um, looking at some of our mission partners or people that we support as a church in mission. And uh, tonight we're going to hear one of the interviews that we heard this morning um, from Jess O'Callaghan, who has been a member of this church and since she was one and grew up here, was in Fuel and was in Legacy and has gone to university. And uh, she's about to do something new after she's finished her degree. And uh, we asked her a few questions, and she did a, a little video for us. And we're going to watch this now, and then we will pray for her, because we're seeking to support her in what she's doing. So let's watch this together. Hi. My name is Jess, and I'm 22. And I've been a part of St John's since I was a toddler. So I'm sure that some of you will know me. But if not, I hope this helps you get to know me a little bit more. For the past three years, I've been studying psychology at the University of Southampton, which has been a challenging but a really great time. And God has been so present. Alongside my degree, I've been a part of the Southampton Christian Union, serving as a personal evangelism coordinator this past year. 
where my role is to encourage and equip the CU to share Jesus with their friends and our campus, largely through follow-up courses, such as the Just Looking course, which St John's also ran earlier this year. This was a really great opportunity to see God working and to see students come to know him. Through working with the CU, seeing the way that God has used and grown me throughout this, I was encouraged to continue my passion for evangelism after my degree. Whilst I loved being on the CU committee, I never felt that I had enough time to devote to it, which it deserved. And so when I was considering what to do this next year, Relay was suggested to me. If you didn't know, Christian unions around the UK are run under the organisation of UCCF, who also run a year training programme called Relay. Relay involves working alongside and supporting your CU, as well as meeting with individuals on a one-to-one -one basis. You take part in regular training sessions, as well as attending three training conferences throughout the year. Relay also includes individual weekly Bible study sessions, including a general study program and an elective study program, which is personally tailored to your interests and gifts. I think this will be a great opportunity for me to grow personally and spiritually, getting to know Jesus better, sharing him with students and being taken out of my comfort zone throughout this. St John's support has been so valuable to me throughout my life and I'm so thankful to be a part of such a supportive community. I would also love to ask for your support as I take this next step. I would greatly appreciate prayer that I adjust well to the new role, growing personally and spiritually and staying grounded in working for God's glory. I would also love prayer for the CU to be led by God as restrictions lift and for students to come to know him through the work of the CU. From September, I will be sending out an email newsletter about twice a term to keep you updated on the work at Southampton CU and how you can best support me, both prayerfully and financially. If you would like to receive my newsletter, or for more information, please do contact me or head to the Teams page on the UCCF website and my page will be under the name of Jess O'Callaghan. I look forward to sharing with you the exciting work of Southampton CU very soon. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's great to um, hear those stories and about some of our young people going off to uni and then and serving God in different ways. And uh, as you know, uh, well, perhaps you don't know, one of our vision uh, statements, one of our three parts of our vision statement is to grow the next generation. We're committed here at St John's to grow the next generation. It's brilliant to hear what Jess is doing. So let's just take a moment to pray for her and then pray for our young people as they're going to go out for their groups. So let's just bow our heads. Father God, I do thank you um, that you've called to, to grow the next generation, um, that they may know Jesus and grow in discipleship with him. Father, thank you for, for Jess and uh, thank you for your calling on her life. Thank you for the degree that she's been studying and, and now we pray for her, particularly as she does this relay work with UCCF in the university, reaching out to students on campus. Please will you help her in that work? Um, help her uh, to, to make uh, good friendships so she may be able to witness uh, to Jesus. And we pray that you'll help her to grow in godliness as well through it. So bless her and uh, guide her in the work that you've given her to do. And Father, we pray for our young people as they go out for their group tonight. Thank you for each one of them. Thank you that you know them and love them dearly. And we pray for their group, that you will um, help them and their leaders to learn more about the good news of Jesus, that they may grow uh, in faith. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, um, Matt, where are they going? Which door are they going out? They're going out the exit to the garden. It's not raining. The, and the rest of us, while they do that, you might like to, to mumble through your face marks to the person next to you and say hello briefly. Great. Um, shall we just gather back together? We're going to just have a, a short time of prayer now. 
um, before we hear um, God's word read to us. So let's just pray, particularly praying um, to the end of this, this, uh, this pandemic, um, committing it to God. God's uh, word says that praise be to God our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comforts. Father, thank you that you are a God of comfort, a God of compassion. And we pray for our world in the midst of this pandemic. We pray for an end to this virus. We thank you for the the strides that have been made in bringing an end to it. But we know there are many nations, many countries, which are deeply affected um, by the virus and with many deaths. We think especially of India. It continues to suffer badly. Father, we pray for your people there. We think of the Medhursts working there. We pray for all those who suffer there. May you bring them comfort. May they hear of your compassion that is found in Christ Jesus. And we pray for closer to home, for our government and for all those in authority over us, for the scientists who are advising the government. We pray for good and godly decisions about the way forward. Father, would you uh, direct our nation in the way of Christ? May we seek to look out for those who are less fortunate than us, that we may serve the common good. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we also pray for our fellowship here at St. John's. Father God, we uh, thank you that you're the God of comfort and of peace, and we know that our fellowship has been deeply affected over these few months. Father, we know that um, the pandemic has brought much disunity to us because we can't meet properly face to face. Father, we pray for our fellowship. We pray for our unity in Christ. Would you protect it and would you draw us back together? Would you help us to bear with one another in that? We think of those who are, uh, find it hard, the thought of coming back together in fellowship. And we pray for those who are eager and impatient to come back together. Would you help us to recognise as a church the, the cross-section of opinion and help us to walk together in the way of Christ, that we may come back together, united in Christ Jesus, for we ask in his name. Amen. And we uh, continue to come before you, Lord, uh, uh, with uh, the desire for a new youth worker uh, as we prepare uh, in a few weeks to say goodbye to the Lockwoods, we are seeking a new youth worker, a youth minister. Father, we commit this post to you. We thank you for the advertisement and we pray that you would lead the right person to fulfill that role. Direct us, we pray. Help us to be discerning. And we pray for the the people applying that you will be leading them. And through it, we pray that you will grow the next generation within this church, that many young people will call on the name of the Lord and grow in faith and understanding of him. So we commit this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's just conclude this time of of prayer by saying the words of the, the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Just a a couple of notices to remind you of. Hopefully you've all seen the email about the June picnics. Um, We're seeking to try and help uh, bring people back together. And this is one of the initiatives that we're trying throughout June and into July is these uh, picnics that will begin next um, weekend. Um, But we really need to hear back from you. Um, uh, Chris will be putting those together uh, and uh, we really need to hear back from you. If you've not already filled in the form, please fill it in. I do think these are going to be great opportunities for us just as tentatively we're coming out of lockdown to come back together. I think it's so important for us to do as we bear with one another. So do look out for those, those June picnics and hopefully the weather will be, will be brilliant. The weather will be brilliant. <laughs> Um, so that's that. Uh, the other thing to say is that the next couple of weeks that I'm going to be on jury service, so you might not be able to get hold of me as much over these next couple of weeks, so please do bear that in mind. Um, uh, the last thing to do is to um, read the bands of marriage, which we forgot this morning, so <laughs> we, that's why we need to do it now. <laughs> so, um, so I published the bands of marriage between Franklin Nicholas Joseph Mills and Sarah Louise Watson, both of this parish, St. John's Blackheath. This is for the second time of asking. And if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. Uh, Let's just take a moment to pray for them. Father, we thank you for marriage. And we recognize how important marriage is is, uh, for society, Uh, and not least for Franklin and Sarah. Please help them in their preparation for marriage. Uh, Would you help them to to know more the depth of love for each other, but importantly, the depth of your love for them. We commit them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our Bible reading, and then uh, Hannah's going to come up and speak to us. So thank you, Susan. The reading this evening is from the book of Hebrews, and it's the whole of uh, chapter 11 and the first three verses of chapter 12. So Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch, was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, 
who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched round them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. 
There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, hello. Thank you, Susan. There's nothing like a preacher changing a six-verse passage to a 40-plus-verse passage on the evening. I appreciate that greatly. You did a great job. <laughs> it's lovely to be here tonight. My name is Hannah, um, if you don't know me, and I'm a member of the Leaders and Preachers team tonight. And we are going to be flitting between that Hebrews passage tonight and Ephesians 4, which would be helpful for you to have open to begin with. And tonight, um, we are continuing our sermon series on the ones found in Ephesians Four, and we are looking at, as I'm sure you have gathered by now, one faith. And I've been thinking a lot about faith over the last couple of weeks, and I've come to the conclusion that we all have faith in many things. We all have faith in many things. For example, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? maybe a tiny little bit, it's okay. It's just the weather app. I have a lot of faith in the weather app on my phone. Let me explain why. I can tell you that at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, it's going to be sunshine with 10% chance of rain, we'll ignore that bit, and 17 degrees where I go to work in Abbey Wood. I have a lot of faith that that will come to fruition. I also have a lot of faith in the fridge in my flat that it will keep my food cold and it will keep my food and my drinks nice and fresh so I can enjoy them. I have faith in my kettle. I have faith that it will boil the water to the perfect temperature for a nice cup of tea. I have faith in my students that I teach at school that I set a deadline and they complete the work to the deadline that I set. More fool me. I have faith in my friends that if I tell them something and I ask them to keep it secret, that they will respect that and they will keep whatever I've asked um, in confidence. I have faith in my husband that he will remain loyal to me and he will do as I ask. <laughs> but the reality is that there will be times I'll look at the weather app on my phone and it will say 17 degrees and sunny and actually it will be raining. There will be times where maybe there's too much food in the fridge or the fuse goes on the fridge or the kettle and those things don't work the way I expect them to. There will be many times where my students don't complete their work on time and cause me great frustration. 
There'll be times where my friends let me down. And there'll be times even where my husband doesn't live up to my arguably unrealistic expectations. Why is that? That's because only faith in Jesus Christ is having faith in something that promises never to perish, spoil, or fade. And that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about our one faith in Jesus Christ. And the reason um, I asked for that Hebrews reading, and we're not going to be going through it verse by verse, I promise. Um, But the reason I asked for it is because right at the beginning, there's this beautiful definition of what faith is. So let's center our eyes on that tonight. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's the faith we're talking about tonight. That's our faith in Jesus Christ, something that we are totally sure of and something we can have total confidence in. And we're going to talk about our one faith tonight under two banners. We're going to start by talking about that one faith is timeless. One faith is timeless. And then that's going to lead on to us having a think about the fact that it is one faith which saves. So one faith is timeless and one faith saves. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father God, I thank you that we can be here tonight, whether we're in the building or we're watching this in the future on YouTube. God, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to this earth to live as fully God and fully human, to die a death he did not to des- did not deserve and rise again in glory so that we can be free. God, give us hearts and minds open to be challenged and encouraged tonight. Help us live a life that is worthy of the calling we have received. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start by looking at the fact that one faith is timeless. And we're going to start back in Ephesians 4, just with verse 1. And I'm aware that when this very short passage has been spoken about every week for however many weeks it's been, that there could be a little bit of repetition here. However, verse 1 of chapter 4 is really rich when we're thinking about faith, which is why we're starting there tonight. So Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 4, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. As a prisoner for the Lord, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus from prison. And we can see here that he's in prison because of his work for the Lord. And therefore, we can decipher that he's in prison for his work for the Lord because he believes his work for the Lord and his faith in the Lord is worth suffering for. Because he believes his faith and work in the Lord is worth suffering for. And if we're talking about the fact that one faith is timeless, one faith is timeless, then we are thinking about the fact that all Christians everywhere and from all time have this same faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith shouldn't dwindle from generation to generation. Arguably, our faith should match up to the faith of someone like Paul. So my first question tonight, starting with a nice, easy question, does your faith, is it worth suffering for? Is our faith here tonight on the same level as someone like Paul writing this letter from prison because of his work for the Lord? Is our faith something that is worth suffering for? I don't ask that as someone standing up here who has got all the answers. If someone walked through that door right now and, let's say, pointed a gun at me and said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Because if you do, I'm going to shoot this gun. I would love to be the person that goes, yes, I do. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so could you too, and we can be free together. I'd love that to be my answer. It would be all over Twitter. I'm sure it would get a couple of articles written about it. People might even know my name. But I can't promise that would be my response. I'd love it to be my response. 
I don't know what I would say in that situation. I'm sure you don't, hand on heart, know what you would say in that situation. And in one sense, that's okay. Because there's grace upon grace upon grace for every time, the end of verse 1, we don't live up to the calling we have received. However, that doesn't mean our faith shouldn't be something we are continuing to strive to grow and mature. We should be looking at Christians that have gone before us, in generations before us, maybe people that are still alive today, and people years and years before us, like Paul, as examples of faith that we can learn from, examples of faith that we can strive to aim for a faith like theirs. There's grace upon grace whenever we mess up, but that doesn't change the fact we should be striving to mature and strengthen our faith each day. And that's where this passage in Hebrews comes in. I think it's really interesting. There are loads of people mentioned in this Hebrews passage. You've got Abraham, Noah, Jacob, Isaac, to name a few. And I also love the fact they say, well, I can't talk about anything else. I've run out of time, basically. And then give us another 20 verses or whatever it is. Um, but actually, there's loads of people mentioned here talking about faith. And yet these are all people that they were living under this faith of a promise. They knew they were working to something. They had this promise from God. But they never see the fruition of their promise. And still they have faith. Verse 13 says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Verse 39, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. I don't know about you, but that's a faith I want. That's a faith that I want to aspire to have, a faith that even though they didn't know exactly what that promise was, they were convicted enough to strive for it each day, to move their families, to move their children, to move their livelihoods, to build an ark. That's the sort of faith we should be aspiring to grow in each day. And if we believe that one faith is timeless, that's because we're believing in the same truths as all the people that have come before us. Our faith is based on the same objective truths. It's based on the gospel in the same way that Paul's faith was when he was writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. And why is that? That is because these people believed, Paul believed, that one faith saves it is by one faith which saves. That's what we're going to break down a little bit tonight. I wonder, have you seen the television program In It To Win It? Hands up. Has anyone seen? You're not missing much, not going to lie. A um, little bit of a synopsis for all of you very well-educated people that don't watch rubbish on television like me. In It to Win It is a BBC television show. Um, it's a game show, like so many others. There are contestants on it, and there's a machine with names on balls, and <laughs> the machine pops a ball out, and uh, that person leaves where they're sitting, and they join Winner's Row. If you hadn't worked that out, that's the place you want to be. You want to be on Winner's Row. So that person joins Winner's Row, and then on Winner's Row, they answer questions. They answer questions. Is this ringing a bell to anybody in here? Oh, you're all so boring. <laughs> they answer questions. Um, each question they get right, there is a cash prize. Um, that continues to build up, and everything is hunky-dory until they get a question wrong. When they get a question wrong, they leave Winner's Row. I can't quite believe I'm explaining this. They leave Winner's Row, and they move to the middle of the stage, which is the red zone. No one wants to be in the red zone. It's not the place to be. You see, in the red zone, you lose your multiple choice option, and you have to answer a question with no multiple choice. You either know the answer, or you don't. If you get it right, guess where you go? 
Winner's row, wake up, very good, lovely. Winner's row, if you get it wrong, you go all the way back to the beginning and you're waiting for the machine to pop your name out and see if it does or not. At the end of the show, if you're in winner's row, you win the money. If you're anywhere else, you go home with nothing. It's like so many other game shows. There's a bit of knowledge involved. I'd be rubbish, but there is a bit of question knowledge involved. You need a calm head, frankly, but actually there's a fair amount of luck it really depends on, on your luck in a game like that. And why am I talking about this tonight? It's not because I want you all to go home and watch it. It's actually quite rubbish. But for so many people, maybe you can relate to this, Christianity can feel like a bit of a game show. It can feel a bit like in it to win it. Is your name going to come out of the machine? Are you going to be lucky? Oh, you've done something wrong. You're going to go into the red zone. Are you going to get forgiven or are you going to go back all the way to the start? Maybe you can relate to that on some level. You see, the simple yet beautiful truth that Louis preached two weeks ago is ultimately, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you are saved. If you accept that you mess up each day and that you need Jesus Christ in your life as your Savior, because on your own, you are not complete without him, and if you allow him in as your Lord to rule over all areas of your life, then you are saved. There's no red zone. There's no names in a machine at random. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you are saved. However, eternal life isn't a given. Eternal life isn't a given. Yes, it's open to all who believe and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, but eternal life isn't a given. Why am I laboring that point? Because I truly believe where we are in Blackheath, in London, in England, this is a really hard message for some people to hear. But I'm a really good person. I do really good things. I volunteer every week. I'm on the board of trustees for 300 different charities. I don't have a minute for myself. I'm always doing this for my children, and my children are in this, and I've even got a blue Peter badge. But without Jesus, you are not saved. Eternal life isn't a given. There was a Guardian headline recently not a big Guardian reader, but I did see it on my phone, um, that said, I only know one God, and that's me. I only know one God, and that's me. And I saw it pop up on my phone, and I just kept scrolling, and I didn't read it. And then a little while later, I remembered about it, and it made me sad that I wasn't shocked. Does that make sense? That I, it made me sad that that headline didn't shock me because it's not a shockable concept where we are right now. I only know one God and that's me, is a reality for a lot of people, even if they don't accept it. And maybe you can relate to that on a level as well tonight. Eternal life isn't a given. We need Jesus Christ in our lives as our Savior and our Lord. There was some research recently, um, it was 20, last year, 2020, called The Global God Divide. You might have seen it. It's really interesting reading. And it was all about um, morality and God and prayer. Um, and 34 countries had people surveyed. It's about 30,000 people surveyed. Um, and there's loads of headlines from it, but I saw one that really stuck out to me of the countries with the highest GDP were the countries with the lowest percentage of people saying they needed God in their lives. So the countries that had the highest income, like the UK, Spain, Germany, were top two, three of the top five, were the ones with the lowest percentage of people saying they needed God in their lives. For example, 31% of people surveyed in the UK said they needed either God or prayer in their lives. And I said that to Matt, my husband, earlier, and he went, oh, that's quite high. <laughs> and then we had a whole discussion about, well, we don't actually know if that's Jesus. <laughs> that was just God. And that's a conversation for another day. But 
31% of people in the UK said they needed either God or prayer in their lives. You see, salvation, eternal life with Jesus, salvation is a total sacrificial act. Jesus dying on the cross was a total sacrificial act that none of us deserve. No amount of works, no amount of good deeds, no amount of nice words allows us to earn God's grace, but he freely gives it out to each of us each day who believe and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Acts 2.38 says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And we're not just talking here about eternal life that is way off in the future. We're not talking about you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and then nothing really happens and you get on with your life for however many years and then when you die, everything's amazing. No, we're talking about a God that when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, He brings light into darkness. He brings restoration into situations that feel totally broken. He brings hope into totally hopeless situations. That's a God that I want a relationship with. I don't know about you. That's a God that I want to know on a personal level. That's a God that doesn't promise that everything's going to be okay each day, but he does promise whatever happens, he'll be with me in it. And he'll come out the other side with me and will work things for my good because he loves me as his child. That's a God I want to tell people about. Is it a God that you want to tell people about? My question tonight is, do you believe you need saving? Do you believe without Jesus in your life your life isn't complete. That you need Jesus as your savior, that your friends, however great their life is, however sorted they are, they need Jesus in their life as their Lord and savior. And and he can transform their lives, however good it feels already. Whatever their top benchmark is, he can make it better because he is above all things. And if you do believe that you need saving, what does it look like to have faith in every area of your life? What does it look like to have total faith in Jesus when it comes to money? What does it look like to have total faith in Jesus when it comes to where you live or how you're going to pay your mortgage or where your kids are going to go to school? What does it look like to have total faith in Jesus when it comes to everything you own? What is it faith like to have total faith and dependence on Jesus when you're sat in the pub on a Saturday night with non-Christian friends? What does it look like to have total faith in Jesus when you're watching the television late at night? What does it look like to have faith in Jesus in every area of your life? Many of you are aware um, that myself and my husband Matt are moving to Blackpool in only a few weeks' time, um, end of July. And we weren't planning on moving to Blackpool, not going to lie. I don't think we'd even ever spoken about Blackpool in the five years we'd been married. Um, And we weren't convinced we were going to move to Blackpool when we first started considering it. And what made us change our mind is when we were walking around the streets of where we're going to be working in Blackpool, and Matt turned to me and he said, these people here feel totally hopeless. These people here feel like there is absolutely nothing for them, and they are the bottom of the pecking order. But Jesus loves them as much as he loves me. Jesus loves them as much as he loves everybody else. And there can be restoration and transformation and freedom for them as much as there can for anyone else. And someone's got to go and tell them that. That's faith. I mean, that wasn't me. <laughs> I wasn't quite there yet. But that's what faith can do. Faith in Jesus can transform situations that feel totally broken. Faith in Jesus can transform situations that feel like there's no worth. 
And actually, on a personal level for us, what does it look like to have faith in everything? Moving to Blackpool is taking quite a lot of faith, I'll be honest with you. And I'm not telling you that to brag, because actually, I'm feeling quite vulnerable about it. It means quitting my job. It means leaving our home, which we love. It means leaving a community that we are so invested in. It means leaving loads of friends. It means leaving lots of little people that Matt is obsessed with. <laughs> it's taking a fair amount of stepping out in faith right now. It means leaving financial security. But when God calls us to have faith in every area of our lives, sometimes we've got to go. And I'm not saying to all go home and put your house on the market. Please don't do that. But do this week think about what it looks like for you to have faith in every area of your life. And maybe there's an area of your life that you're holding back on right now. What does it look like for you to have faith in every area of your life? Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus, the one whom faith in is timeless, the one that we can be encouraged in our faith and challenged in our faith from generations before us, the one that we should be striving to grow in our faith each day, the one in whom faith in totally transforms every situation of our lives, and the one whom ultimately faith in saves. Let's take a moment to pray. Let's take a moment to reflect on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. Where are you with, with him right now? Are there areas of your life that, that aren't open to him right now? Are there areas of your faith that feel really weak? Father God, we know you are a God of transformation. We know and trust in you as a God that brings light into situations that can feel totally darkness and totally helpless. We know you're a God that brings total restoration when all other help feels lost. God, help us grow in our faith. Help us step out in our faith. Forgive us when we mess up and we thank you for the grace that you pour bountifully over each of us every time we do. Help us fix our eyes on your son, Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. Hannah, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to turn to to praise God. Um, we're going to praise God for, for Jesus, um, the one in whom we have faith. So if you'd like to, please do stand.
which is treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Heavenly Father, we praise you again for Jesus. Help us to keep holding on to him. Amen. Amen. Please do text you. Amen. Um, just reached the end of our, our service. Thank you so much for, for coming. And uh, we have to exit the building promptly under the, the, the rules, but we can, uh, you can gather uh, safely outside um, after um, the service. And do keep asking those questions that we've been challenged with um, tonight. Those questions. One faith is timeless. One faith saves. Do you believe you need saving? And what does it look like to have total faith in every day, every area of your life? A faith that transforms. What does that mean for you? Let's just take a moment to close in prayer. So let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Father, thank you for what we've heard tonight from your word. We pray that you'll continue to remind us of it in the days ahead, in the places we find ourselves, that we would indeed run with perseverance the the race marked out, that we may run it in faith, trusting in the Lord Jesus. And so now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our one Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. See you next time.